so this is a workshop on how to be a voice actor and some of the uh, tricks and things about it. I'm going to start off with a little promo. Um, I did a documentary about this and talked to a bunch of actors, talked about how they got into the business, things to do to help you uh, work with your voice and just sort of what it's about. So I'm going to start off with a little uh, video, which is by Mello was in the video. We're lucky enough to have Miss Mello Lee here for this. What is a voice actor? That's actually kind of a hard question. I heard the spot on the radio with my voice, and I was like, hey, <laughs> that's me. It was like, how come I can't blank, like how come I can't get a single part, you know? I must be that bad. That this is a, a dream career. This is living the dream. And you will always pay a price for your dreams. We've been goofing around with voices, you know, behind closed doors. It was a session for me. Yeah, you know what's <laughs> But um, I can answer some questions now. We've got Mella in the room, or we can watch some more scenes from it. What do you guys want to do? What do you got? I just want to know if that was going to be a volume two and three, since I actually earned this. You are doing on volume one. Um, there was an, originally the yeah. idea of doing volume two and three, um, and it may still happen. It just uh, was a lot of work to get volume one out. Okay. And we still haven't recovered from that. Oh, a long story. Fair <laughs> short of it all. Um, but let me go ahead and play the rest of it, and then we can open it up to some Q&A. Dubbing is like, you know, patting your head and rubbing your tummy and kicking your foot up and winking all at the same time. You have to be able to watch what's going on on camera. You have to be able to look at the script. You have to be able to listen to the director. You have to be able to um, fall into the character and then to sustain the character simultaneously. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Good. Good. It's good to see you guys. Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, once you get in the booth, the, the, the first thing that happens is that engineer comes in and fusses around and resets a mic and you set your stand up and you make sure you're in the right script. Uh, engineer comes in and adjusts your mic and makes sure you're okay and gives you your headphones. That's like the first in a series of intimate experiences that you'll have in the studio because they're very close and they are they basically put the microphone so close to your mouth it feels like a dental x-ray. And they adjust it to your height and they give you a uh, music stand with headsets and uh, and your script. So I will leave that up for there. So that's the basic look inside a studio. Um, so the lights back up. We'll have Mel Lee come up, who is a very accomplished voice actress. Uh, and at the end of this, we have some DVDs to get out. One of them is from the series uh, Unlimited Blade Work of HJ9, which is also signed by Sam Regal and then Mel Leek and I'll add her lovely signature to it. Yay! Yay! And then um, I have two copies of uh, the DVD to give up. So, um, so whoever gives me the most awesome questions needs the first. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyways, who in here wants to be a voice actor? You do? Yeah. All right. Have you guys done any sort of voice acting experience? Have you been playing around with it a little bit? I've auditioned at a radio station down the road, the cool. Mosteri. Yeah. First and, commercial work. And have you learned any mic technique classes? Have you? Uh, taking voiceover workshops, which is also down the road, with okay. a woman named Abby Holmes, who's an Australian voice actor. Cool. Uh, anybody else who's done any sort of basic training on voice acting? And no. Okay. All right. So, well, do um, you guys have any questions about what, how to get in, anything like that? How to get your voice ready for it? What's it like? All of us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let me start with just maybe a general primer on it then. A lot of people come to voice acting um, 
from different different areas. And, and Mella, I think you can have your own story on it, but you were a, a vocalist. And how did you, you were, but first and foremost, the best place they put down is that you have to be an actor person. You can't just want to basically do funny voices. You have to have an acting background, and that's the key thing. And then once you know your acting chops, then you can really do some interesting things on the mic. But it's important to know how to act. And, and this DVD talks a lot about that. So in addition to doing some of like the workshop and things like that, I really recommend getting involved in the theater. As much as that as you can be behind your belt is going to be huge. So. Is there, sorry, I was just going to ask yeah, you, no, is, is there a particular uh, area where the best voice voiceover actors have come from, like uh, have some been better at comedy or some been better at the uh, playing of serious roles or like is there a favorite, is there a There yeah, really is no like true formula for it. Um, you know Steve Bloom who, who's on there and is a wonderful voice actor who's done a lot of stuff is the exception that he actually had no acting training whatsoever and he, but he'll tell you at the same time that it would have helped him and he wouldn't have minded having it. So he's the anomaly. For the most part I've got uh, Sam Regal is an actor who came from improv background, and that really helps him because it allows him to be very spontaneous. So improv's great, but at the same time, because the mic is, you know, because you have to perform so much with your voice, theater's a really great training ground. Because theater, you have to be big, you have to get everybody in the background to see it. And the same thing with your voice. Your voice has to carry the entire performance. You don't have the luxury of being able to say, when I do this, you know I'm being funny. You know, you have to have that with the voice. And theater helps you get there by being bigger than you would normally be for TV or yeah. And Sam is from the UCB uh, Upright Citizens Brigade. I don't know if you're familiar with American Improv. Um, the, the major houses are uh, Second City and UCB, and, and, and the writers go to a show that was fairly popular in the States called Saturday Night Live. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. And um, so Sam's with Upright Citizens Brigade, and, and, and you, you will find um, that improv is extremely important in. Not as much in anime, but in animation specifically, because they'll have a script, but you end up recording a good hour or two over and beyond the script, you know, with interplay with your actors, and they, they just want you to do stuff, and they end up animating to it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's what's really interesting is that it's not just so much of reading what's on the page, but it's what you add to the page. So a lot of times, some of the best bits that you'll see in animation are something that an actor just threw in there because they just felt like it added to what was already there. And it's spontaneous, and it's funny, and it works because it wasn't scripted. That's and actually something I've always wondered um, when it comes to um, uh, blending voices with the animation. Is mm -hmm. it uh, animation first, and then the, the actors try to voice into it, or voicing first, and then the animator? It depends. Uh, yeah, it's oh, both. Okay. Yeah. So in the U.S., um, it, the biggest push is for you to do, to try and do it, the original animation, is to have the actor do it first. Because you do have a lot more liberty at that point to kind of take it places that a script doesn't necessarily know yet. But sometimes for the constraints of budget, you have to start getting the animation going first. So then you can be working simultaneously and you're not dependent on this long, slow process of doing acting and then drawing and then, you know, then you do your skeletal things of it. So it just depends. It can be both ways. I think that, and, and with anime, it's vastly different. We're here in the States is that you've got to fit what's already there. Mm -hmm. It's very, very rare that you get the luxury to reanimate anything. So it just depends. So does it take the uh, the translators to have some experience in animating to know, oh, well, well, we can't have a four-syllable word here, even though that's what yes. translates? Yes, this is one of the best translators. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't speak in Japanese, so I technically am not a translator, but but I write what they call to sync. So uh, okay. I will write to... Uh, so, so, so it's going to be translated twice? So, it's so it gets translated, and then it gets necessarily... I would say that the second draft isn't a translation, but it is turning it into that's something that's right. entertainment. Yeah, it's, it's writing. It's just happy to know that you can only write that many words in, in that to, line. To take the Japanese out of the equation. Yeah, you take the, the Japanese uh, out of the equation as much as possible. The English out of the exactly. English. Exactly. Yes, yes. And there's a lot of English that comes from <laughs> And you look and you're like, I have no idea what that means. And she'll say, it's what we call, like what she's written, and Christy's really great. I've, I've worked on several shows with her, Vampire Night, um, Fake Stay Night, When They Cry. Do Ra Ra Ra. Do Ra Ra. But sometimes to be you know to, to to be true to the translation, we'll have what they translated, and then the alternate, which what is what we would say in English. Yeah. To be kind, and, and it'll be really like really you want us to say that, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, it's like a girl talking about her ball sack, and we're like, it doesn't <laughs> translate. Same, but I'll do it. 
just in case the client really, really wants me to touch my balls. Back. So on Wednesday night, there's a line from the character's an actor named, or the character named Lancer, and Lancer, and Wednesday is all about these archetypal images from history, and one of them was this Celtic legend, and he had, he had this this power called his gay bowl, <laughs> spelled G A E, and. And literally one of the lines they wanted me to record was, you can't defeat my gay bull. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> it doesn't really translate the way you think it does. So yeah, you get a lot of that. Yeah. So you've created a voiceover demo, and you've been sending it out to studios, and you get some replies. They tell you, uh, they give you some cr uh, critiques and what to work on, and you still hear them. How do you get through that period of if nothing's happening, just to recreate yourself, just to remarket. Waiting tables, um, <laughs> maze, and park bars. <laughs> you know, the biggest thing in this in, in this industry is is persistence, and you know, it's called stick to itiveness. And you know, if you feel like your demo's not getting anywhere, then yeah, maybe retool it. Um, yeah. But but you, you got to realize that it's it's not going to happen quickly, and it takes constant yeah. constant pushing, putting yourself out there. I took a class. Um, I'd always heard that I had a good voice for voiceover. So um, on a whim, uh, not seriously thinking I'd have a voiceover career, but I, I took a kind of a, an everything under the sun voiceover class for four weeks. And in the back of your mind, you think maybe I'll get discovered, but that's not really going to happen. But I did. And so at the end, I got a, a, an agent. And my very first audition was for uh, Barbie Mattel, and I booked the commercial. Um, I was voted that year as the outstanding new talent for the Audio Publishers Association. Clearly I was going to be driving in a limo everywhere. I <laughs> knew it was going to happen. I mean, I'd never made $3,000 in 15 minutes before in my life. And I was like, this is great. And then there were crickets for about four or five years. I continued to work with a nonprofit organization and worked on Wall Street, um, with a Wall Street mortgage firm. So it was maybe three or $4,000 a year of small parts from 2002 to 2006. And then I booked, in, in one year, uh, three leads. And, and at, as it was, that's still only about $10,000. It's not like you're gonna make a living on that. And, and so, you know, you're saying that persistent, what do you do if you're not quite getting through? When people see what I'm doing now, which is exciting, I get flown all over the world, it was a 10-year arc. Yeah. And that's kind of the average. It's yeah. about a 10 year arc if you guys Well, that's the thing because I took a voiceover workshop with um, this woman who's got a really good rep uh, yeah. reputation in Australia. And then we made the demo together. Didn't quite work. I know I need to retool it, but yeah, it's just persistence there. Yeah. Honestly. And, and I mean, it just also finding what you're good at. I think when you first start as an actor or as a voice actor, you feel this deep desire to go, I can be really cute. I can be very serious. I can sure. use the strange accents if you yeah, want. Sure. But they don't. Yeah. They're, yeah. You're going to find your money. I ended up getting a commercial on TV instead of the voiceover gig for my mm -hmm. first. And is that's the thing, is that you really don't know where it's going to take you. So, and, and be open to that. And, and it's tough. We're sitting here telling you, you know, you don't know where it's going to take you, but at the same time, find your niche. And I know that sounds yeah. like I'm saying two things at the same time, and I am. It, and I, it, I guess the thing to say is at the beginning of your career, Try it all, and then you'll get to know where you're most comfortable, right. and you'll find that that's where your your wheelhouse is. Yeah, definitely. So, what else? You have a question. Who have you guys been in? I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, Mills and Fate Stay Night. Um, she's in Vampire Night. Yuki Cross in Vampire Night. Oh, yeah. uh, Rena in When They Cry. Shinku in Rosen Maiden. Um, everything I worked with Christy on is <laughs> <laughs> She's really good. I, I think people in anime especially, um, they forget that we, we only hear our lines. So she's creating a world for us. This is the scene, this is what's happened, this is what's come before, and now you have 12 seconds to figure it out. And yeah. She's very much about describing it and putting it to that moment and keeping us in a very strict time frame. Um, I've done uh, animation for Lionsgate as well. What's great about anime is it already has a fan base, and then we're, we're adding to, to this fan base, and you've got the manga, and there's just this wonderful mythology that's already created. And when you work for, um, I don't say traditional, but Western animation, where, where you go into the studio and you record, um, it's rare that you meet the other actors. You're just all by yourself, and two years will go by, usually, before it comes to the movies. 
so you're excited, you're gonna be this really big movie, and you know, you're just waiting. So I really like the instant gratification of, of coming into a mythology that is pre-existing, it's very luxurious. And that's one of the things for people who, you know, who maybe like the acting, but necessarily like myself, that don't want to be on the mic, but enjoy the whole process of the storytelling and all of that. Directing is one of those things, particularly with anime, where the actors don't come in knowing the whole story. You're the one in the room who knows the whole story. You're the one who's who has watched all, know where this is gonna be in 26, 20 episodes. And, and when the actors come in, they know what's the line in front of them for that particular minute. So you, you have to have the whole story arc in your head. And if you like telling stories and you like writing, voice directing is a pretty cool thing to do because it allows you to, to do that, tell these stories, and to get submerged in these worlds, and and have that same sort of fun without the being on the mic, which I, which I, you know, I personally don't want to do myself, but um, but I have a huge respect for the voice actors that do it. So. No, that's actually what I was going to ask. Yeah. Do you actually read the the manga through? Do you know any more of it, or do you actually just? Most of the times we don't, yeah, because we don't want to have a preconceived. It really is a director's medium. And so we're familiar with the story, but it's not fresh if you've already made decisions before you walk in the room. Yeah. And as a voice actor, um, more than I think even on camera, you you are waiting for the director and their vision, and you, you slip into that. It's very rare that you would just say, well, this is how I see it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's really no point. You kind of go there with a blank slate, and there are times where Christy has directed me, and, and she says, well, you bawling uncontrollably. And like about, she's like, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm like, that seems like a lot. She's like, more. <laughs> if she knows the performance of the other actors, she knows what the music is going to be. And so you really, you, you're able to, to trust your director. And I think that's where the relationship is pretty extraordinary. Once you've worked five or six years, yeah. um, one of the reasons I'm working more now is because I'm better than I was before. You, you know, you have like some raw talent, but there are some technical things that you just don't know. And so a director, you know, has to come to a place where they're able to communicate with you and you're able to give them what they need on a more regular basis. Right, have you guys seen When They Cry? Is there anybody in here who knows that show? Okay. <laughs> Mello plays a pretty, a very sweet six-year-old who's psychotic. <laughs> Just unhinged psychotic. And it can go from like, hi, I'm really sweet, to, you know, she's I'm going to slash yeah. you. With Who's going to do something? She's like, I wouldn't do that if I <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> And it'll be like that from one scene to the next. I mean, just because of the course of one line, she'll do that. So if an actor comes in cold and they're like, I, really, you want me to go that big? You, that just seems completely, you know, I'm like, trust me, it's going to get worse. <laughs> you think that bad? Me, Cleaver, on a, on a rooftop. <laughs> so, is that, so, yeah. Is that hard, like, just to do that? The, screaming? For your day job, go from, you know, petty cute to uh, screaming and... Crying. Like, do you come home with a sore throat? Or? Sometimes you do. It's, it's, um, you know, for me, I'm lucky that I don't, I don't play screaming characters very often. Okay. I get to play teenagers and stuff, you know, and I get to fight. And I'm usually the girl that's really smart um, and tutors everybody, and I have a magical power. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that, that reluctant hero. Um, but games, especially, they're very difficult for me for my voice um, when you have to die and, and that. But it's usually guys. You guys are the ones that kick ass in the game world. And we'll have guys that do, you know, tour of duty, uh, or Call of Duty, Call of Duty at these really hardcore games and literally are, are blood busting vocal cords. And yeah. G games are something like, so I'll have, say, an actor, it just happened last week, um, and there was an actor who had a session at the end of the day with me, but she had a video game session in the morning and she called and said, I can't do your game today because. I had a video game session, and you know she literally sounded like this. And I'm like, yeah, you're not going to play that teenage girl if you're going to go play tonight. Yeah, right before I came here, um, I was doing a show um, for a production house we work for, and they they basically said we might have some pickups before you fly out to Australia, which was like a Wednesday. I have to leave for the airport at eight o'clock, and so I had like a podcast, a radio interview, something for my band. Uh, I had to do an anime for Bang Zoom, and then I had a show uh, that I was a guest at, and at some, some like a, a jazz thing. 
And then the next day, I had a film about the Afghanistan war, and I was dying, my leg was cut off. I was replacing, they have something called voice replacement, where the acting is a local person, but sometimes the boom doesn't pick up the acting, or the acting's not so great. But the physical is fine, but they literally have you revoice the acting. So I was a CIA agent, and I was uh, working, and, and just, it was really intense. And then I had a show, and then we had Wednesday morning, and I had a, a game that I had to do, and then they didn't call me for the pickup, and I thought, thank God, because I just did this game. My, I mean, like I've I've had about 36 hours of all the work I can handle, and I'm very thankful for myself. I rest. <laughs> and I thought I could <clears throat> take a rest. And um, the phone rang at four o'clock in the afternoon. We have a couple of pickups. That adorable teenager you played on Monday. <laughs> We need you to come in at like six o'clock and just do three lines of adorable. And I'm like, adorable? <laughs> I'm so, what? <laughs> so I was drinking tea and, and just really having to figure out how to make that work before I flew out. Because you do, you, you, there's a moment where the human voice is done. <laughs> but when you talk about you know, doing a teenager and then mixing it all up, what's kind of cool is that, what's really great about voice acting is that, you know, Normally, Mella, if she were doing an on-camera role, would play somebody who's about her age who's female. And what's great about voice acting is she could play an eight-year-old boy one day. Oh, cool! Yeah, or she could play a sophisticated 30-year-old. Really, darling. Or she could play a <laughs> teenage girl. Mom, you're so gross. So you are so not limited to what your physical being is. And that's what's great. And, and with voice acting, you can come in in your pajamas and work. And as long as you sound great, do don't give away all my secrets. <laughs> right here when I look him in the booth, he might even be wearing pants and I wouldn't know. <laughs> so it's cool. It really opens up a flexibility for acting that the on-camera world just does not lend itself to. And you don't have to constantly maintain yourself like particularly female actors do in Hollywood. And and you can it's really a broad spectrum of people and it, I think it adds for much greater talent. Yeah. Who else? What other questions? Uh, with the production and You know, I think that what it will create is better product. I think that there was a lot of, of glut there for a while, and there's been a significant reduction in it. Um, and I may, you know, I may be naive, but I think that it will just concentrate to better stuff. I don't think it will be as prolific as it once was, but I think it's going to go away. And hopefully it will just mean there is a, what's out there is better, as opposed to just dubbing everything that's been possibly dubbed. Let's just, you know, let's just do the good stuff, and that way we don't <laughs> inundate everybody with a bunch of crap. So. You can see the same in, in, in Asian films that are coming over. I mean, you guys maybe not. We can in the states. It used to be we will dub an Asian film or Asian, you know, uh, animation, and it'll be kind of like blah 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 blah. And there's no, there's no reverence for the art form. Yeah. And you'll have a Quentin Tarantino and all these people that grew up on it. They, they really have a reverence for um, the art form, and so the dubbing or or the transfer. Uh, of the medium into a, a different culture, it becomes revered rather than, oh, let's you know, send it out. So I've seen in the last 10 years, I'm sure you have, the quality of, of anime and, and, and different art forms from the East being really raised and seriously bring a level of acting that, that does justice to the art form. So, you know, it, it could conversely be a good thing. It, it just, you, it's just too early to tell at this point. I, hopefully it doesn't stop entirely, but but I've noticed in this year alone, the quality of projects that I've worked on have been much better than say that I worked on four or five years ago. And maybe that's a reflection of me being better and getting better projects, or if it's a reflection of things just be, being a little bit smarter as to what they bring on. Um, um, it's an interesting thing. Do you guys know what ADR is? Yeah, um, because I worked in anime. Additional was, dialogue recording is basically what it's saying. And it's basically at the end of a film where you will do voice replacement or breaths or you're fighting, they haven't picked it up. Or, um, and it's, it's time coded. So it's very much like dubbing an anime. So I was doing something that some of my actor friends were like, oh, I don't do anime. But it means I now get to work on The Good Wife, CSI New York. I revoiced the mermaids for Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, you know, all of these wonderful opportunities happen because I understood dubbing and anime. Yeah. Oh, 
So time code is this thing that runs on top of the screen. If you guys come to the blooper panel this afternoon, you'll see all the stuff has time code on it because it's all these outtakes and things that were never supposed to be shown to people. And there are some really good funny lines on there. But it has a time code on it. And essentially, it's an address track that runs at the top of the video. And it allows for when we're dubbing or doing any sort of specific video spot to, for an engineer to locate a spot with beeps. And then just beep, 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 and then you go. But it's allowing me to say exactly where the lip flaps to cue the person in to put the words right in that spot right there. And that's essentially what the tool that, that helped no one do all this other stuff. And another thing I didn't talk about when you talk about how to break into the industry, a really great way to break into is something called Walla. Do you guys know what Walla is? So Walla is, all, when films are shot, say it's a great huge crowd scene, they don't want the crowd in there when they're shooting the dialogue because it could bleed and it could, you could over, not overhear the star's dialogue. So everybody's really quiet but you're doing this. <laughs> and so after that's all done, they have to actually put crowd noises in there. So they'll have these groups come in and they're of like say seven or eight people and, and they do the walla, they do all the background replacement voices. And, and it's cool, they call it walla because you're essentially supposed to be saying, you know, walla, 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 walla. <laughs> um, and, but you do have actual conversation. But a nice thing about it is that say there's one guy on the edge of the crowd who's going, hey, over here, they'll have you say, you know, Joe, step up and cover that guy. And if you consistently do a really great job, you're gonna get on that director's radar and then gradually transition to bigger roles. So it's a really great way to stop, start out. And I'm sure with any sort of um, television industry here in, in, um, in this area, you're gonna have Walla and that kind of thing. So Walla is just a dubbing version of extra. And it's, yeah, it's just the background, yeah. So it's sort of an entryway into doing, getting into voice acting. And, and it's also a room to feel comfortable in. Not only that, you're working around other people so you kind of see what they do, which is always great because one of the problems with starting out with voice acting is you kind of work in a vacuum. You never really see what anybody else does, and so you're not learning little tips and tricks that can really help you out. And Walla teaches you some things that you wouldn't necessarily know going on your own little backing stuff. So, right. It's another good thing to look into. What else do we got? Go for it. I just wanted to know about SAG cards. Okay. Uh, they just good. had to get them. Really? Um, well, Mel is going to give you better information okay. than I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really fond of, of the system right now, the okay. Screen Actors Guild. Um, we just merged AFTRA uh, yeah. uh, with SAG, and AFTRA allowed you to buy in for $2,500. You could buy in, and, and once you were a member of AFTRA for a year, you were SAG eligible. Um, and if you got like, one job in AFTRA, you could join SAG, which was for approximately $2,500-$3,000. Now that we're merged, they've, they've adopted the SAG version of getting in, which is just vouchers as an extra. Um, there are, some of us that want to lobby, um, if the point of having a union is to have excellence, you know, have a bar, that there will be some other ways to get into Screen Actors Skilled, as in uh, if you have a degree uh, in fine arts or a master's degree, um, then you should receive a voucher because you have actually That's trained work, and you've right. done some work. It yeah. shouldn't be like anybody can just try and be an extra because once you've been at the Royal Shakespeare Company, it's a bit offensive to say, why don't you hang out and see if you can get a voucher as an extra. Um, so we're trying to advocate reciprocity with the uh, with the actors unions across the world because they've given that to us. The okay. Actor skills. So you're trying to make it a bit easier. There are a lot of people right now. Trying. There's a lot going on now that we've merged, but that's one of the things yeah. that we want to advocate um, because they want to do the global <laughs> one rule, which says you know everybody wants to do SAG around the world, but it means that we have to to extend um, that courtesy to our fellow actors in countries that we want to film in Australia, of course, being one. Yeah, and so everybody knows, so the Screen Actors Guild is the actors union, and being a member of SAG, um, it allows you to work on SAG shows. There's some shows that only work with union actors, and they have a higher pay scale. But it also gives you, in I don't know how it is in Australia, but in the States, it gives you something very coveted, which is health insurance. So one of the problems with being a freelancer in the U.S. is that you are your own business. You are, you take care of yourself, you've got no one else really to look out for you, and having some of the support that the union gives you, like health and other things of that nature is a big deal. And it, that's what it's designed to do. It, unfortunately, it creates a lot of obstacles that right now. Right. It, more than it does. And because there is union work and non-union work, do voice actors still require a SAG card? Or well, so here's the thing um, with SAG. SAG has this thing called FIFOR, and it allows you to, to technically you're not, once you become a member of SAG, you are not supposed to work on any non-union contract. Yeah. You can get a big for it. Um, FICOR has is a 
contract agreement with SAG that says um, I gave up my right to vote in certain SAG, all, all SAG elections, yeah. I believe. Um, but at the same time, you can't tell me what I can and can't work on. So you still get all the benefits from SAG, you just can't vote and have the same. So what right. would be the best way, say, if you made the move to the <coughs> yeah. you're trying to be a voice actor and you let the general American accent mm -hmm. yeah. kind of go about it, just Go on and work in everything you possibly can. If yeah. you do get SAG, stay stay FICOR, I would say, until she you can call the Is it Ellie Castle? That's what it's called. Project Notices. The website? Yeah. I don't know. There is a, a, there's a company, and I think it's called Ellie Casting, but they um, do union and non union casting, both voiceover on camera. I, I'm, I'm, if somebody just forwarded me something and wanted me to. Let me see if I still have it. But there um, are definitely, what Mel is talking about, are there are websites and things like that that, particularly for voice acting, you can actually yeah. just submit your sample through the website. Okay. Uh, which is, is it Voice123? Voice, yeah, there's something called Voice Bunny. Is another I've heard of Voice123. Yeah. 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 So it there's definitely a worth that. Them. And finding out who does the games. Um, you know, the Bang Zoom, at, you know, when you're in yeah. Los Angeles, find out who's doing the production companies. And, and honestly, they don't necessarily want you to do it, but just go ahead and drop it off. Yeah. But don't okay. sit down and be like, I've got to talk to the president. Just be yeah. like, you know, I just yeah. came in from just Australia. Drop it in yeah. I, I met Christy and Mella, yeah. and I just want to drop off my reel. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah definitely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, I mean, we're always looking for new talent. And I always, if you want to submit something, contact me through Facebook, and I'd be happy to listen to it and give some tips. And if it's great, then I'll pass it on to the casting directors right now. They really do. Yeah. So yeah, we do need to tell. I mean, that's the thing. It's everything's evolving. We need. Well, it wasn't Marianne. Somebody that you guys found in. There's a guest here, uh, Marianne Miller. Miller. Yeah. And oh, she yes. went through Tony's workshop. Tony yeah. Oliver. This workshop for this project. And uh, ended up being picked for for some anime. Yeah. And she's now a guest at an anime yeah. production. So. so it does. It is. It is possible. And it Doesn't does Kristen happen. Freeman also do those workshops as well? Kristen has known workshops. Yeah, there's a couple of them. And there's there are a bunch in Los Angeles too. There's yeah. a ton right. of, of voice acting. Workshops. And again, like she was saying, sometimes you're in this vacuum when you're just in the studio. It really is important to take classes, no matter how good you think yeah. you are, because that's how you meet people. Yeah, exactly. and that's a big part of it. Because in the voice acting community it is a very generous community. They are very inclined to say, you know what, I I don't I don't I can't do that role, or, or maybe I am good for that role, but also. I've been working with so and so, and she's great. Give her a call. So it's 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 a tight knit community, and they do look out for each other. So once you get into it, right who else? Go for it. Um. So Christy, how did you get into direction? I'm more kind of interested. Yeah. In so um, I went to film school, and I came out of there as a commercial director, and I directed some commercials, and quickly realized that I cannot sell a box of Cheerios for the rest of my life. <laughs> And it was really going to be selling my soul, and I would end up a very sad, lonely person if I did that. And uh, and I knew the owner at Bing Zoom, and he a couple of times said, you know, you want to come into some voice directing, and I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Okay, I do direct camera stuff. And 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 then one day after a particularly horrible shoot, I'm like, um, Eric, you still got something you want to? I'm thinking maybe uh, something else might be good. And uh, and he said, yeah, come on in. And I directed um, a show, a first show I ever directed was something called Idol Project. And I quickly realized that this is horrible, and and this is a much better world for me. And that's how it started, and that was about ten years ago. And from that point on, it's a world where I feel very safe in my windowless studio, in my padded walls. It's a good place for me. So, yeah. and you know, it's like I said, people who who really enjoy the performance and that sort of thing, and necessarily don't necessarily want to be on the mic themselves. It's a great, it's a great it's a good game. You had a question? Well, how would you recommend getting into it? How would you recommend voice acting? Um, I would, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I would just start making connections. I mean, if you if you have um, some stuff, I was going to say you could do some, some sort of fan dubs, but, and that's not a bad thing to do is do a fan dub. Um, you might be sort of challenged by technology, which might make your work look less, and that's kind of a problem. So. Um, I would just start talking to studios and tell them, do you have any directing experience whatsoever? Well, it's not you. Yeah. You know, I think that directing for theater is a pretty good transition trans transition into into doing voice directing. Um, and and understanding voice acting is also a good thing. So it helps to, for one of the things I had learned, because I was not someone who was a voice actor, was when I wanted an actor to put the voice in a different place, what that meant. And I'm like, 
I want it to sound this way, but I do not know how to tell you how to do that. And so I had to learn that as, as one of my bag of tricks in order to tell someone what to do. You know, just make it different. I don't know. That doesn't help them. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons why I love working with you, and, and, and I think where directors become really successful is because they're able to communicate with actors. So even taking, if you're not wanting to be a voiceover artist, but still taking that class, yeah. because it is maddening. I'm, I've, I've been on a couple of commercials, not animation, but where you had everybody from you know the middle America, some advertising firm, and there's six people on the line. It's an ISDN patch, and I got hired for this one commercial to to be kind of Bostonian and and a um, little bit of Kath and Hepburn, here we are, everyone, and look to the left, and, and it was supposed to be like that, and they said, well, yeah, well, wouldn't it be kind of cool if you were more like a, a Southwest Airlines stewardess? <laughs> um, everyone here to the left, we have, oh, but like more like Barbie, and it was just like, oh my God, it was like six people who'd never directed before, and they just had idea after idea. Um, what if it was um, different? <laughs> and you're just like, it was hard, but it just takes 67, and you're just like, you want to like pull your hair out. And, and having a director, they don't understand that if you have a good director, you feel really relaxed. Yeah. And, and, and even somebody who's talking in a positive way when you've totally blown it, because they want you to be outside of the box, but if somebody's like, oh my god, that was terrible, that's not what I wanted, then you're just sort of you know, inside of yourself. So having a director that has a good language, it actually makes you a better artist. And it's your job as a director to make the actor feel comfortable at any given time. So that's the most important thing. Is even if the actor is like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing anymore there. <laughs> Again, don't give away. <laughs> it's your job to make them feel grounded in some way or another. Because if they're completely lost, then then nothing's going to work. And everything's just going to spiral into vortex of ruin. So you've got to figure out a way. Even when they feel like they're untethered, you've got to figure out how to, to get them grounded. Have you ever had a point where a director's been doing this all, you know, make it sound like Barbie or someone, where you just wanted to turn around and say, well, figure out what you want and then call them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. never with me. <laughs> no, you can't say anything. Um, you really, you know, and, and to be honest, what you're describing, it's almost like I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's terrible. Uh, we get paid anywhere from 100 to a few thousand dollars an hour. So you guys keep yeah. figuring it out. Okay. Yeah. You can be a jerk to me. I mean, because I've had the privilege of working for Malibu Maid Service and scrubbing toilets at the stars for fifteen dollars an hour. So if you want to be, you know, disingenuous or a little bit haughty and hire me, you know, and give me a career, I'm really quite honestly, sometimes you're like irritated, but it's a champagne problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's not looking for food in the in, in the Sahara Desert. It's like really, you know. Hey, it's a, it's a wonderful problem to have to be able to work with people that value your talent and just don't know how to communicate with you. Yeah. And you know, it, one of the things when you're in the room, sometimes as a director, I'll have producers in there with me. And <laughs> that's all you have to say. <laughs> yeah. See how much you enjoy this. <laughs> sometimes I'll have. You know, for the most, you know, there are some good They ones. call us ahead of time. By the way, the producers will be in the room. Yeah. Yeah, and so if that that's the question that, that you would ask. You know, do you have someone saying, I don't know what I want, but do this. <clears throat> that's my job is to, so there's a button that I speak in that talks right to the actors. The actors can't hear what's going on in the control room and the producer guard. It's completely soundproof. And so it's, you know, it can be maddening for this actor to hear, you know, they did this line, and suddenly I look in this room and there's people doing this. And so this actor's like, oh my god, I'm going to get fired in a second. <laughs> so, you know, and it could be, you know, when they get back and I said, sorry, we're just ordering lunch, you know. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. But it could also be that, that the, the producer is giving me very mixed messages, and so I have to, you know, say very politely to the actor, I'm so sorry, I don't want to say, they don't know what the fuck they want, <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out, but to say something very polite, like, you know, we're just, we're just working it out here, we're getting it settled, so bear with us, and please know it's not you, it's, it's us figuring it out here, because it, it can be very frustrating right now. So. Yes? Um, Christy, has, has it ever been an issue for you to be a woman in, a, in an industry that's dominated by men? 
say that I can concretely, concretely point to something and say, you know, there was an extreme example of sexism. I, I think that, um, I think that, yeah, I do think that it's there. I think that you're, you're battling it on some small level kind of all the time, and it's, it's just the, just, it's just the way it is. And I don't want to say that, you know, be naive and say no, in the industry we don't have any of that. But in America, it exists very much, and it's not necessarily an overt problem, but, um, but definitely there are times when there are obstacles that you have to figure out a way around. And you know, the, the video game industry is a pretty guy-dominated or industry, so it helps that I grew up with two older brothers, and so I can be a little, you know, I can hang with the guys. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it does there, it is there. But it's not, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, a huge portion of the industry. It's just the nature of this. Would you have any advice to give to young women who are trying to follow in your footsteps? Sure. Um, don't let any obstacle stand in your way. If you think that there is somebody that is putting up a barrier because you are a woman, you just essentially figure out a way around it. Be smarter than them. I think that for the most part when you greet that sort of obstacle, it's not somebody that's generally very smart in the first place. So if you can see it, just be smarter than they are and figure out how to, how to work with it. I think that women can be very, very powerful in that situation. Okay. All right, how are we doing with time? Uh, do some stuff to give out. Yeah, we have time for one or two more questions. One or two more questions, and then I've got some giveaways. So if you guys blow me away with some questions, whoever these last couple of questions, they're amazing, then we'll start getting some stuff out. Common phrases or anything that you use to communicate with the actor when you say the producer and they're really going to want them to know what's going on. I would like to say I do, and maybe now that you give me that idea, I may. <laughs> <laughs> but as of right now, no. But uh, but I'm getting to develop some out this very spot. <laughs> Too, particularly for anime, I think a very helpful tool is musical timing. And I think that one of the things that helps Mella a lot is her musical background. Because there's a, when you're doing things to picture and to sing, there's a rhythm to it. And you kind of, we always preview the shot first in Japanese so you can sort of see what's going on. You, and you do glean a lot from that. But if you also have a sense of rhythm, you'll kind of say, okay, flat, 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 pause, flat, 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 pause, flat, flat, flat. <laughs> and if you can kind of, you know, tap that out in your head, it is, it's a good skill. But, um, but any kind of theater, any kind of learning to belt something out and be big, that's going to help you out. Is, yeah. is it possible to be uh, a good voiceover actor, but then have your career sunk by terrible singing skills? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are mutually exclusive talents in the voice acting. Oh, okay. yeah, you do not need them to be singing. So, so does that mean a really good singer who might be a terrible voiceover actor? Correct. Or Correct. And even for voiceovers, um, they can be really great on-camera actors who just suck <coughs> You know, it's, it, is, it is a unique skill, so they don't necessarily tra translate across all mediums. Some actors are very um, into the miser technique, which is acting and reacting. So their entire acting is to react from the person that they're opposite. Wow. So if you're in a booth... Then there's nobody else but you in that booth? And they're, they're like as flat as can be, and they're just lost, and you can hear it, they're acting. It's, it's just you reacting to yourself, your imaginary so, And if you don't have one, <laughs> it's a healthy imagination will serve you well. I'm just wondering, like, in, say in the next video game I play, and then there's, there's dialogue, and then there's grunting as, or as the character gets hurt or something. Does that mean there might be two different actors there? Like for an ADR, yeah. like a grunt? Yeah, and, and, and they could be two different actors there who, who did it different times. So, yeah. That's so for the most part, one actor will lay things down, reacting to another actor who isn't even in there yet. So, and then... He's got to, you know, sort of in his head imagine what that guy's going to sound like, and he responded to the line. So, yeah, a, a healthy imagination is a good thing. But also, taking acting classes is going to help you get an understanding of what that performance is going to be by working with other people. So, so yeah, it, it is very helpful. And Lisa, yeah, uh, not so much for Miller this time because I already know the answer this one. Okay. Um, if I wanted to interview you for my fan base, um, how would I go about setting that up in a, the best way or the proper way of doing it rather than just Facebooking people? Which um, I can give you my card. That'd, That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> All right. Any, any, yeah? Is it difficult to do like an intimate scene where there is that cross dialogue happening a lot when you because you don't have the other actor across from you? Is it 
is that one of the harder things to do? No, it was a new director. <laughs> I owe her so much money at the end of this. <laughs> I mean, they really get you into that moment, you know, and, and, and their description of it, and you, you know, and you also trust that if the other actor isn't in there, she's going to insert, you know, a complimentary performance for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there anything that you do in particular for when you're about to go for the really loud voice so that you don't lie your throat or anything? Yeah, well there's vocal warm ups that you should do regardless before any session. So if you were to come in from, you know, not having warmed up your vocal cords before going into the session, it's gonna sound kind of crappy. Yeah. So you do the vocal warm ups, there's anything from just singing a song on the car radio there to some series that if you go to the voice acting workshop, they will actually tell you different things you can do for vocal that are actual scales and things like that. Um, but there is also different ways to place your voice, which is also something good to learn in a workshop, so that you don't blow out your throat. So there are definitely screaming, but if you scream from your throat the entire time, it's gonna hurt. But if you put the voice down more in your diaphragm, A, it'll sound better on the mic, it's gonna have a big forward sound coming out, and you won't be sounding like you spoke and not filled with cigarettes for tap on it. So. Give him the free stuff, Christine. All right, free stuff. So <laughs> now I'm just about those two. She's gonna sign. Um, oh, and I will give and this out. You have to have great acting <laughs> questions. Uh, who else wants to be a voice actor? Who wants to? There you go. First hand up. All right, but I have more free stuff. Woo! Woo! Uh, uh, I know, right? Uh, All right. Um, is there, I'm going to give out a messenger bag. Woo! Yeah. To this guy here, because he's been in all my panels before. Yes. Okay. Uh, you got a DVD, too. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, this is just going out in the audience. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right. And uh, let's see what I got. I'm gonna do one more. It's for you because I know you like Sayuki Reload. I mean, uh, Samurai Champloo. Yes. <laughs> Would you rather have gin or food? Jean, please. Wow. <laughs> Not only that, but you're dressed as Chie today. I gotta yeah. get a picture of you before you get it all done. <laughs> so thank you guys for coming. Uh, there's more film this afternoon. There are uh, some really great. Yeah, some really great bloopers at five, and then at two, I did a show for a season of Yu-Gi-Oh that got shelled that nobody's ever seen. I was in it. Mel was in it. Johnny Ross was in it. It's never been exposed at all. I was kind of snuck it here. So you guys can see some stuff in there.